Today I'm going to talk about how taking carbohydrates with other things can actually make the glycemic effect better. And it's coming right up. We know that carbohydrates tend to increase blood glucose as well as insulin. And that hormone insulin is really important because that's what tells your body to store that calories and that can be stored as body fat. So if we're trying to lose it, we want to try and minimize that effect and that's why a lot of people use low carbohydrate diets. But there's actually a number of factors that influences the effect of carbohydrates and how high the blood glucose goes, which is also called the glycemic index. That is, a certain type of carbohydrate is going to raise the blood glucose more than others, and that's easily measured in a standardized fashion with the glycemic index. The first factor that's important is the total number of carbohydrates, and this is well known to carbohydrate counters, for example. An average North American might take two to 300 carbohydrates per day, whereas low carbohydrate is variously defined. It might be 50 grams per day, and some people go all the way up to 130 grams per day. And the ketogenic diet is usually less than 20 grams per day. But that's only one of the factors. A second factor is the net carbs. And again, fairly well known, you take the total number of carbs and you subtract the fiber. And that's because fiber is not absorbed by the body. So if you have 100 grams of carbohydrates, but 50 of them is fiber, you don't really see that other 50. The other 50 grams of fiber mostly moves through your gut and is often excreted into the stools. The third is food order, and we covered that in our previous video about eating the carbs last because it has a tremendous effect on how high your blood glucose and insulin goes. Eating the carbs first versus eating the carbs last can have almost double the effect on the blood glucose. The fourth thing we're going to talk about today is what other foods you can take with those carbs to sort of blunt the effect on blood glucose glucose. In Japan, they like to look at rice because that's their main carbohydrate. And they've done studies where they will look at the glycemic index of rice compared to rice combined with other meals. And there's two things that they have looked at in particular. One is vinegar. And it turns out when that you add that vinegar to the rice, the glycemic index is reduced significantly. In sushi rice, it, it drops down to 59 compared to an average of 100 for white rice. The other thing they noted was that eating pickled foods, which is also very common, pickled vegetables, will also reduce the glycemic index of white rice down to about 75. Several other things were noted. Eating rice with milk, for example, can also lead to high drops, and that might be because of the whey protein that tends to stimulate the insulin. So it might be a mixed bag with the uh, milk. They also look at bean products because it's very common to eat um, soybeans and natto, which, uh, as well as miso, which is also made from soy. And these bean products, when consumed with the rice, also blunts the effect of the uh, blood glucose. Many studies have shown that the addition of lemon juice to carbohydrates can significantly reduce the glycemic index of those foods up to 40-50%, which is very striking because it's the same total number of carbohydrates and the exact same type of carbohydrates. So how can adding the acid like lemon juice make it so much better? Um, it turns out that it comes down to how our body digests starch. There are two key enzymes to be aware of, salivary, meaning in the saliva, and pancreatic, alpha amylase. Amylase is an enzyme that breaks down the starch. Starches are chains of sugars like glucose. So in order for you to digest them, you have to cut them up into smaller pieces so that it can be digested. As soon as we start to eat the bread or the other carbohydrate, the salivary alpha amylase begins to work. It starts to digest it. 
And then that amylase that's in the saliva is still active even down in the stomach until the pH goes down to about three or four where it gets inactivated. Then as the stomach pushes out the food, the pancreatic enzyme takes over and digests it. So most people had assumed previously that the pancreas did most of the work because there wasn't that much time in the, you know, in the chewing and in the stomach. But that doesn't turn out to be true. In regular meals, as you're eating, the pH of the stomach actually goes up to about 4.5 to 7 and may take one to two hours to drop into the range where you neutralize the salivary amylase. And therefore, up to 60 to 80% of the starch in bread may happen before the stomach discharges into the pancreas. In this study, acid-induced reduction of the glycemic response to starch-rich foods, they are looking at the salivary alpha amylase inhibition hypothesis. And what they did was they took some bread and pasta and gluten-free bread, and they wanted to test how much saliva can break down these foods. So they mixed it with some saliva, they chopped it up, and then they added either water or lemon juice, and then they tested how much was digested. This was done outside the body or in vitro. And the effect was most prominent for the bread. When you look at the amount of starch that was released or digested into these smaller segments, less than half of the starch was released just by adding the lemon juice. The lemon juice had blocked the salivary alpha amylase, and therefore the starch was not being digested and therefore couldn't be absorbed as quickly and therefore the rise in the blood glucose would be much slower. You also see the same effect with vinegar and bread. In this study called vinegar supplementation lowers glucose and insulin responses and increases satiety after a bread meal in healthy subjects. What they did was they took people and they gave them bread and they tested them with various levels of vinegar, a little bit, the medium amount and a lot. And then they tested the blood glucose and the blood insulin. And what they find is very striking. There's a clear dose response relationship that the more vinegar you take with the same amount of bread, the lower your blood glucose and the lower your insulin because it's probably not being completely digested. So therefore your body isn't seeing as much of the simple sugars that are all chopped up. And also it produces the highest satiety. So you're getting this sort of double effect. The bread with the vinegar isn't producing as much effect, but it's also making you not want to eat as much. So the bottom line is you don't want to be eating naked carbs. That is carbs just by themselves because you're going to expose yourself to the maximum glucose and maximum insulin responses. In fact, the best thing is to add a little bit of acid, which is going to inhibit the digestion of the foods, which is going to make you see less of that carbohydrate. So you can use things such as fermented foods, which have lactic acid, vinegar, which is acetic acid, or lemons, or lemon juice, which has citric acid. And if you do that, you're going to see a significant benefit in terms of lowering of that sugar. And eating naked carbs was a big mistake for people who were told to eat an ultra low fat diet because if you're trying to cut down the fats, a lot of times you're not going to have the protein either. So you're going to get those naked carbs like white bread and jam, which are just going to spike your glucose, spike your insulin, and then be digested so fast that it's going to leave you ravenous shortly after. So keep in mind that the carbohydrates are important in terms of the physiologic response, but there are those four important factors, including the total amount, the net carbohydrates, the food order, and also what you take it with, particularly the acid. I hope you learned something. If you did, please share it with your friends. They may learn something too. Thanks for watching. See you next week.